Summer. June has arrived and summer officially begins later on in this month. And it's surely been feeling like that lately anyway. Wow. Get outside a little bit and um, summer perspiration. But it's good. It's enjoyable. And we have some plans coming up for this summer that I'm excited to be uh, looking forward to, I'm excited to offer and to participate with you in because, uh, well, it has been a journey and uh, it'll be good to get some fellowship going. This morning, we're here streaming live from the chapel and uh, we have some guys here that actually some of them will be hearing from a little bit later today. And um, not all of them. We have three guys here, some, and they're going to be sharing our connect. You know, as summer comes on, I have a question for you to uh, bring up. And the question is this, what do you do for fun, for the fun of it? I'm going to give you a moment on that because for some people, it's like, whew, Yep, got it, right now, whether it's uh, quilting or uh, gardening or uh, just getting outside in the weather with some of the family. Comes up quick for some. Eh, I need to stop here and think, really, what am I doing for fun? So, going to give you a minute to come up with that. Well, not quite a minute because your time's up right now. So, what do you do for fun? What's come to mind for you? For me, there are several things, and they're kind of mixed together. One of the things is uh, biking. Now, that's an interesting thing, but I'm putting it up for an important reason. It's not biking like in Harley's. I was talking to a guy yesterday, and uh, he was talking about not being able to ride a two-wheeler anymore, uh, Harley, that is. So he was going to a trike, and he told me getting this $26,000 plus tax, and whoosh, here's a solution, because I'm not talking about biking like in Harley. I'm talking about biking like in Raleigh or Diamondback, where you pedal the bicycle. This solution for this guy was to mount his bicycle on his motorcycle. But uh, I'm looking more like this, that kind of scene. And for me, that is something that I get to do on the way to work some days if the weather cooperates and get the smells and the sights and the sounds and the feeling of the air going through. And it's just for the fun of it, just for the fun of it. If we go to southern Indiana, there's kind of a mixed bag to this because in the part of southern Indiana we go to, they have a strong coal mining business. Well, they used to, and they used to coal mine not by digging shafts into the ground or the mountain, but they would strip away the top layers of the dirt. And the result of that over years has been this topography, this landscape that is just like Whew, so rough and wild and vegetation has grown up over the years. And when we go to southern Indiana to get out into the wooded area and to be able to run or to bike those trails, I, it's, it's for the fun of it, just for the fun of it. For me, those are some things that bring fun. For some other folks, maybe it's, a good movie, Frozen, or this week at our house, they've been talking about Princess Bride and how novel that film was and quotes that remain. So movies are some. Some people love to just kind of absorb themselves in a book. What to do for fun. Of course, during summertime, there's always, do you recognize anybody on this? There's family fun. Josh has been during this COVID time and with Isaiah being especially restricted 
here and his family's result has been accumulating family fun things like goats and hogs and chickens and geese and family fun. My wife says it's kind of like reading some of the books when she was a child and the family fun that they're experiencing. Grandkids are a fun thing. Had some grandkids over and we dug for treasure and uh, flew a kite and ran around with the wheelbarrow. Things for fun. How about this one? I really get into trials for fun. I get joy from the situations that are troublesome, difficult, hard, so that they make you have to think, okay, what do I do with this now? I've never heard anyone say that to me. I really enjoy getting in to the trials. I've heard that kind of about trails, fun or trails that are difficult, challenging, trying to figure out what I do next. But trials, even though they're spelled very similarly, yep, not so much. And I want you to notice what our Lord, through a first century preacher, who was his physical brother, what our Lord, through a first century pre preacher who was the Lord's physical brother, says to us by turning with me to James chapter 1. So I'm going to ask you to get out your Bible and go there to James chapter 1. Our Lord had a physical brother. As a matter of fact, he had several when he was here on earth. And James this physical brother, wrote this book of James that I'm asking you to turn to. And uh, this first century preacher was the pastor of the first church in Jerusalem. At least that's what the book of Acts tells us. Acts 15, verse 13, Acts 21, verses 15 and following. James was this first pastor. And he was the Lord's brother. Apostle Paul, saw, talking about James, said, I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Same mother, <clears throat> different fathers. For James, it was the father Joseph. For Jesus, it was... Um, the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit and the conception there. When Jesus was being spoken about in the book of Matthew, chapter 13, it says this, Is not this the carpenter's son? That's the reference to Joseph. Is not his mother Mary? Are not his brothers, and that are listed here, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? I wonder who this Joseph was named after. Guess that's pretty clear, isn't it? Simon and Judas are not all his sisters with us. Why did this man, where, excuse me, did this man get all these things. And he's talking about the wisdom with which Jesus spoke, and they were talking about the mighty acts which he did, the things that he was accomplishing, some of them outright miraculous. And so this is what they said. And the person we're going to listen in on is Jesus' physical brother. Same mother, well, they did come to have the same father when James, trusting Jesus Christ, his brother, as his Lord and Savior, was born of the Spirit, like James tells us in his book, being born of the Spirit, born of the Spirit so that they had the same spiritual father 
even God. But one Jesus was here, this, for even his brothers did not believe in him. They did not trust he was and is who he said he is. That comes from James, or excuse me, John chapter 7 at verse 5. So now, having said all that to establish kind of uh, the thinking that James had looking over the years to his brother, who then makes those claims and rises from the dead, I want you to look in with me at James chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. James, it says, a servant, a voluntary voluntary slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, talking about his brother. Who he's talking to are the 12 tribes in the dispersion. He's talking about those who were of Israeli descendants. They were Israelites. He sends them greetings. And then I want you to see that James gets right to the point, beginning at chapter 1, verse 2. Consider it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance or steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, its full impact, so that you may be perfect, complete, lacking in nothing. This morning, this is part of of our Promises of God series, these exceedingly great and precious promises that are over the top. And this morning we come to a promise that is right here. Knowing that the testing of your faith, verse 3, produces something. The promise is that the trials, the testings, the temptations in your life are going somewhere. The trials are like a trail that's taking you somewhere. And where that is, God makes clear to us in this passage. And the issue for us in life is to go somewhere on this trail of trial with God and where he's going, to join him in what he is looking to accomplish. These are over-the-top promises of God, and the trail of this trial that is right in front of you is going somewhere. We can trust God. This morning, we're going to be talking about when meeting trial. Got to be careful, because trail and trial are so close. Almost got my tongue twisted. You can't imagine that. When meeting trial, move on in it to triumph. That's what the Lord talks to us about here in this over-the-top promise, and it's possible. It's possible to move on to the trial. He's going to tell us how, and there are three things here that I want you to look at with me. Three things. What you're called to is spoken about there in verse 2. What you're to know here about this verse 3, and what you're to allow to take place in your life. Now, I need to tell you just straight up that most people don't think of joy and trial as going together. Most people don't have that connection in their mind. As a matter of fact, I kind of pulled out a quote of a very popular media and actually pastor of of a church that's very large and influential, what, what he said about this idea of being joyful, finding joy in trial, he said this, that the natural human response to trials is not to rejoice. 
Therefore, the believer must make a conscious commitment to face them with joy. Do do you know, do, do we need the preacher to tell us that the natural human response to trial is not to rejoice? I don't think so. We kind of kind of pick that up naturally. Jay Adams, who is a counselor that I have learned a whole bunch from, talks like this, and I want to share this with you. He said that uh, James is just kind of like right to the point. Consider it entirely happy situation. Consider it an entirely happy situation when you fall into trials of various sorts. Think of it. Here, in the midst of all sorts of trial, James, who sounds a little cruel here, the way he jumps into this, just like right off in what he said to them, in the midst of all sorts of trial, He lays a new responsibility. Count trials joy. J. Adams goes on to say, unthinking people who do not consider life from a biblical perspective don't want to be told that they should count their trials as joy. Perhaps you too think that way. Perhaps, more than perhaps, It's like trial, joy. I mean, it's easy in the abstract to do this, but when you're in the midst of it, facing it, like Jay talks about a guy named Bob here. Bob comes home from work, and as soon as the door opens, Barb, his wife, and the kids know immediately that Bob's in the dump again. Things didn't go well at work. Bob did something that he thought he should get recognition and a congratulations for on this last project, but because of what had happened since then, his boss chews him out. And Bob grumbles, saying, what a way to be treated when you're trying to do a good job. Makes you want to quit. Or just put in time instead of giving it your all. You don't quit. You didn't quit. Did you? No, but I have a a half a mind to on Monday. Remember, Bob, you're not working for your boss. You're working for the Lord. Jesus. I know, Bob says. But though I shouldn't let it get me down, it just always does. It just does over and over. Trial. Trial of various kinds. There is a way to move on in triumph when you meet trial. There is a away. And the way is spoken about here for us. Most people don't see it that way, but you can. What you're called to, and he makes it very clear here, consider it joy. By the way, the it here, the it is the trial. You consider the situation, the difficulty, the hardship, fiery trial that's spoken about sometimes. When you're up against it, when your nose is pressed against it, that's what he's talking about, it. And the statement is, consider. Consider it. Now, consider is talking about something that has to go on inside of you. This is for something that has to take place here in you. And it's an interesting word because the word actually means to lead, and when it's put like this in its context, it's about leading your mind 
in a particular direction on this, to go somewhere in your thinking. Now, to inside intentionally take your thinking somewhere calls for practice. You know, there are some people who are gamers. They play video games. Matter of fact, if you can see this up close, this is actually a family photo. This was recently when the grandkids were at our house digging treasure and flying kites and running around in wheelbarrow and that kind of thing. They're also gaming for a while. And this is a picture. I know it looks like Nate. Well, not like Nate now. This is like Nate when we knew him a few years ago. And this is actually a side view of Kalo when he is gaming there and he is like really taking joy in this. You know, I've had some other members of my family who were gamers, still are, uh, have kind of appointments for them to do gaming together. And as they're doing this gaming, when they're gaming, one of these members could actually, members of my family, my family could actually turn around and talk to me running this game. And they would move the icons, or what do they call them, the avatars, the person that they were in the game in such a fashion that as they listened to the music, they didn't even have to look at what was on the screen, and they would be able to move it and avoid the things and jump over the right thing and shoot the right thing or hop on top of the right thing and move it right along in doing that because they had been so practice inside taking their thinking in a direction and then their actions that they could actually do this without even looking at the screen. That's practice. And I want you to know that this, taking your mind so that it's led, calls for practice. So that actions come out from this that are, well, established and possible for you. We can do this. We can do this gaming thing. We can do it with videos where we can just... <sighs> by the sounds, by the sights, know how to move. Matter of fact, many people are able to get to the next level and the next level through the practice. So here, there's a level to move to, and it's the level of triumph in the trial, moving to that level. When we're talking about Bob, and Barb, you remember them? Bob and Barb, when he comes home. Consider now for a moment what has been going on inside of Bob. His boss failed to compliment him for the job well done and instead chews him out. You can read Bob's thoughts from what he said to Barbara. He's disappointed. He tells himself, this isn't fair. I deserve something better than this. But no sooner does he begin to think that way than gloom begins to settle on him like a dense fog. And the more he allows himself to think like that, the gloomier he becomes and the worse things get. Yes, you say, that's exactly what happens. So, how do you get to triumph here? Here it is. You lead your mind so that something happens inside. That's what we do. And he's going to go on. You lead your mind to 
all joy. Consider it all joy. All of it refers to the whole. We as individuals, the way that God says this to us, he's talking about as individuals going through events, circumstances, experiences, difficult times, troublesome, that makes you think, okay, what do I do next? You're going through this as an individual and all of it, the whole as it comes together, needs to be thought about. We call this sometimes the big picture, like it's recorded for us in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, where it says, we know that God works all things, not individually. That verse says, God works all things Together, yes, for the individual in the individual situation, these are all working together for good, for benefit to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. The thing that we are to lead our minds in inside action, take my mind there. And by the way, this is an imperative. He says this is absolutely essential. This is imperatival. This is like so needed. You lead your mind to consider that God in the whole, in the whole of this, all of it is taking it for good. It's, I'm going to move this up, it's joy. We can come to a cheerful, calm, happiness in heart. Joy, because God intentionally is doing this in the whole. The individual is long, tiresome, difficult, troublesome, but in the whole, God is accomplishing the good that he intends. You know, there are some proverbs that I've listed here, and I want you to hear them, because what he's telling us to do is to take your heart to a place that is cheerful, calm, a happiness in heart. This is what he's calling us to do. And it is a move to triumph when you intentionally inside practice leading your mind here so much so that you can turn around and just listen to what's happened and move like a gamer in the correct manner. You can. Listen to these proverbs that talk about taking yourself to a happy heart. As a matter of fact, many of these proverbs just kind of run in sequence here. Well, a couple of them anyway. A merry heart, the sage of old, the wise man says, makes a cheerful countenance, a, a cheerful appearance. But sorrow of the heart like Bob was biting into, like he was chewing over and over and over and getting the full flavor and savor of. And, you know, sometimes, yeah, me. I want to choose to savor the bitter. It, by sorrow of heart, the spirit is broken. When you lead your mind there, Proverbs 15, 13. A merry heart, taking your mind by practice in this direction, inside, makes a cheerful confident, confident, countenance. But by sorrow, the spirit, sorrow of heart, the spirit is broken. Proverbs 15, 15, all the days of the afflicted hurt, they're evil. But for he who is of a merry heart, he has a continuous feast. Oh. 
A merry heart, Proverbs 17, 22. A merry heart does good like medicine. Do you ever take a medicine and it starts to help? An antibiotic, something to relieve the pain, something to help the healing come along? It does good like medicine, but a broken spirit that comes from sorrow in the heart, it dries the bones so they begin to dissipate. The internal structure goes down, the infrastructure. So, Ecclesiastes 9, go eat your bread with joy. Enjoy your life there. Eat it with joy. So, first point here. You're called to intentionally take your mind by practice to this calmness, this happiness of heart because of what a merry heart does. Oops, wrong thing. There we go. I want to add one other thing here. He says, whenever, when. It's not if. It's not like if you have trial. It's when. And the when is ever like in every Every time trial comes, be so practiced that you go there. Be so practiced when you encounter, you meet, or you fall into these trials. You know, this is very interesting how he describes this encountering the trials. Do you remember, do you remember the night on which Christ was born? I mean, from the book of Luke, of course. The book of Luke talks about the shepherds being out in the field, guarding their flocks by night. And suddenly, the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And, and they were sore afraid. They were like filled with fear. That thing that he's talking about, suddenly this fearful situation being on them is the same way he describes encountering a problem, coming into trials, having this event take place in your life. Suddenly it surrounds you. It's it's kind of like all around you. And he says, lead your mind this direction whenever, like in Every time you are surrounded by trials of various kinds. Do we have trials of various kinds? Are we surrounded by them? Folks, trials are here. Matter of fact, there's a lot of interaction going on to a worldwide trial that people individually are participating in, surrounded by a trial. And what he says here for us, to take your mind this way, is imperatival. It is a, we need to, we really need to. So, whenever you fall into Trials. You know, <clears throat> this word for trial is the word that we've talked about last week. It's a word from 1 Corinthians 10.13. It's the same word here. It's the word where you test something to prove it. We've been, because of the nature of the situation, putting up a backyard pool here because of the nature of the trial and looking for some fun and because there was a gift given to uh, Michelle and with this, putting in a pool. And you know, when that water goes in, you kind of test it. Some people stick their foot in to see, ooh, if this is too cold for me to hop into, right now or put their hand in which is a little more hmm, let me say i guess it can take a little bit variation in temperature better than but but that's the test that is done to approve this so that it's yeah 
It's, we, we do the same thing. When my mom used to feed formula to my younger siblings, I remember her taking her wrist and this formula and throwing the bottle that way on her wrist to kind of test and approve that this temperature was acceptable for a nursing baby here, that this bottle formula was the right temperature. That's what this trial means. It's a test to see if it's approved, that this is something that is where it needs to be, or if it's not, it's off the mark. That's when the word trial becomes temptation. It's the same word, and it gets translated the same way. So he's saying, whenever what surrounds you is this testing to see if you're going to go along with the Lord on this or if you're going to miss the mark, falling into sin and a trial then becomes a temptation, a lure to go a different route. So, having said that, we're ready for this. Oops, back this up. We're ready for this. What you're to know. Several things that he lists here for what you're to know. You are to know this by experiencing. You get this. By personal experience, you learn that this testing, it's a different word that he uses here, but it carries the same idea. He's kind of like saying it from a different angle. This testing, you can see it gets translated, trial testing. This testing of your faith, your confidence, your convinced confidence and reliance on God in his direction, his provision here, produces, it works in you, endurance, steadfast. You're, you need to know this by the experience of what you're going through. The experience of the trial, you need to know that your faith is being tested, and your testing is to produce in you an endurance, a staying in there. I want you to know that this is what God is up to in every trial that comes along. And wow, do we have need of this. Do we have need of endurance? We do. We live in a time when we don't like to wait. I have people tell me frequently, I'm very impatient. Don't upset my impatientness. You don't want me to be impatient. I want things to move, and I want them to move when I want them to. But you notice that this trial... I am so over this. I have just, I, I've had it. I've heard COVID up to here. It, it's enough. Let's move on. Let's get beyond this. Let's close the door. Okay. Well, um, no matter what happens, this trial isn't going away tomorrow. The best predictions that I've seen are that in like 2022, the uh, impact of this will cause an immunity to be so widespread that it will kind of settle. Do you know what year this is? This is the middle of the year in 2020. And they're talking about 2022. It's going to be around. It's going to be around. 
And what shall we do? Have doom and gloom and griping and complaining? Or consider it, consider it an opportunity to lead my mind to a calmness and happiness of heart. Because God is working the whole of it, the big picture, yes, in my individual life and in the life of people around the world for what his goal is, for where he's going, individually and in the world. So, Look with me at Hebrews chapter 10. It's really close in our Bible, like there's the book of James, and right before James, towards the back, or towards the front of the Bible, James is behind the book of Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 10, I want you to look in with me. I'm going to actually pick up at verse 35, and I want you to see what this says with me. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence. Do not throw away your, con your convinced confidence that, that there is a God that is doing what he's doing and he's doing it intentionally and he's going somewhere in this trial. Don't throw away your trust, your trust in God here. You can look at the context of this. He's talking about a full assurance of your faith. Don't throw away your confidence, which has a great reward from God. Verse 36, for you have need of endurance. There's that term, that thing of staying in there. You have need of endurance so that when you have done the will of God, what he is going after and calling us to, you will receive what is promised. This over-the-top thing of God, these exceedingly great and precious promises, you'll receive them. For yet a little while, the coming one, namely Jesus, will come and he will not delay. But my righteous ones, those who are concerned to stay with the Lord and do it right here. My righteous ones shall live by this confidence, this trust in me, my faith. And if he shrinks back, verse 38, that's a she too, if she shrinks back from this, my soul has no pleasure. This isn't aligned with me. This isn't where I want you to be. My soul, quoting as from the Lord, has no pleasure in this. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed. We're not of those who are headed for judgment and damnation, for separation from God in an eternity called hell. We're not, we're not set for that, but we are those who have faith and preserve our souls. You and I have need of endurance. You have need so that we can receive what is promised. And I want you to see another passage here. Turn with me to James chapter 1 again, verse 12, where he says, blessed is the man or the woman who remains steadfast. That's that term, who endures, who hangs in there, who stays with it, who goes on this trail in the trial with God. Blessed is he, for when he has stood the test, that's the term, dampening or putting that formula on your wrist, sticking that foot into the water, when they have stood the test from God, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Because those who love him, well, Jesus said it this way, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, follow my directions. If you love me, stay with me on this. Brothers and sisters, this is where we are at. And oh, do we need to hang with him. You know, this week, I've got a copy of it here. <clears throat> the governor of the state of Indiana, Governor Holcomb, has issued a executive order. Actually, it's a continuation 
I'd like you to hear what he says. March 6, 2020, I issued an executive order concerning the state of Indiana and its health emergency exists in the state. And since then, on March 11th, the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 to be a global pandemic. And on March 13th, the President of the United States declared a national emergency with respect to this dangerous virus. And whereas this virus has now spread to every county throughout the state of Indiana, of which, as to the last note of my record, 27 in Blackford County with two deaths, on March 16th, the Indiana State Department of Health confirmed the first case, excuse me, March 6th, they confirmed the first case, and on March 16th, they reported the first death in Indiana, and within a span of 12 weeks, Indiana has now had 35,700 more than that number of cases, and over 2,000 deaths. On April 30th and May 1st, I again on those dates extended the declaration, and now he extends it again. It's had financial impact, he says. 600,000 Hoosiers applying for unemployment in the first two months. There is a threat to safety. The reason I'm bringing this all up is to say, this trial is a trial that we need to hang with the Lord in just like he says in every other trial. And it is up to you, imperatival, and me to lead my mind to a place where I have a calm, cheerful happiness of heart concerning it, the trial, because God is producing something we desperately need in our time, and that is a hanging in there, a staying in there with him under it. This is the Bible. This isn't Pastor Tom's idea. This is straight up the Bible. When we, you know, it's very interesting. We started this series on promises the very weekend that COVID suspended church services. And we made an adjustment in regards to how we were going to present this. And we have been presenting this series on these exceedingly great and precious promises. One thing I know, God works everything in his time. What a great truth. Sometimes I have a hard time comprehending the truth God is bringing to my heart at the very moment of need, sometimes in trial, sometimes in, comprehend, in temptation. But I, I tell you this, it's because of where I'm leading my heart, not because it's so difficult to understand. This is where we're to take our heart. This is what he says, because it is the very crown of life. So, having said that, let's conclude this by what you're to allow. Verse number four. And allow, let, steadfastness. You're to consider this, what you're called to, knowing that God is producing this endurance, and then you are to allow this endurance this thing God is producing, this hanging in there with him on this, you're to allow this endurance, same thing as in verse 3, this steadfastness to have its full effect. 
You are to allow it to reach the goal, to reach its goal. That's what the, this word means. It's the word talos. It's a derivative of that, which means that it's going in a direction. This trail of trial is going somewhere. And your and my aim is to move on in it to triumph when we meet the trial. We're to move on in it to the victory, to the crown, the very crown of life. Let this endurance reach its goal so that it is brought to God's goal. Look at what he says. And allow or let steadfastness, endurance, have its full effect, reach its goal, so that, statement of purpose, you may be perfect, complete, lacking in nothing. God has a goal. In Ephesians chapter 2 and Ephesians 4, God talks about his goal. His goal, when you've been saved, you remember Ephesians 2, 8, he says, for by grace you are saved through, through, what is that again? Through, through your trust, through your trust in what God did in Jesus Christ, through faith, and not of yourself, it's the gift of God. It's not of works that no one should boast. That's what goes on, and God has a goal in saving you. He saved you totally on the works of Jesus Christ, not on yours. You have to trust in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And when you trust that, God rescues you. And he rescues you for a goal, a goal he has, a goal that he states even before he told us in Ephesians 2 about this rescue. It's the goal that in the ages to come, he may show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards you in Christ Jesus. God wants to hold you up as a demonstration. In all the ages to come, not just now, in all the ages to come, he wants to show in you what his grace can do. And what his grace calls us to do is to come, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. This endurance has this goal work. And this goal work comes out, Ephesians 2.10, because we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for the good works, the actions that now come from your life, the actions that come from you and me, the good works that God has foreordained, he set them up before, that we should walk in them, that we should live them out. This is God's goal. This brings you to a place of being completed and not lacking. This is where God is going with you and me, and believe me, when I go over this, went over this yesterday, (sighs) I realize how much I wipe out on leading my mind because actually I'm more like Bob here. Not Bob as in our deacon, but this Bob that I'm talking about. I'm more like Bob. Yeah. And this is where we need to go because this is God's goal. You have need of it. I have need of it. We have need of endurance. You know, there's a song. As a matter of fact, we've got a link that we put out on the site, posted it. I was told that you make beautiful things. You make beautiful things out of dust. You make beautiful things out of us. That's what this is doing. That's where this is going. And I want to tell you 
about a song where an individual named Ron Hamilton. Ron Hamilton was in the ministry. He was attempting to serve the Lord. And as he was going through this, he started to have an eye problem, a trial. It was a difficult thing. And they looked, investigated, and they found out that this may be malignant and we're going to have to do a surgery on it. And we can't tell you what the outcome of this procedure is going to be. If this is a malignancy, we're going to take out your eye, but if not, then we'll be able just to adjust some things and you'll come out. Well, when he came out, he had to wear a patch. That's where the ministry maybe patched the pirate. My children growing up knew about Ron Hamilton as Patch the Pirate because he had to wear And eye patch. By the way, let me just add this. Right now, today, Ron Hamilton has another trial, which is called early onset dementia. And I want you to know that that trial, like this trial, is the very same, that you have to consider it leads your mind here. Ron wrote this song, which has become quite a well-known, well-received song. God never moves without purpose or plan. When in trying his servant and molding a man or a woman, he didn't add that, I did, or molding a man, give thanks to the Lord, though your testing seem long. 2022? In darkness, he gives his song. I couldn't see the shadows ahead, so I looked at the cross of my Savior instead and bowed to the will of the Master that day, and peace came, and tears fled away. Now I see the trials come from above. God strengthens his children, and he purges them in love. My Father knows best, and I trust in his care through purging. More fruit I will bear, like the fruits of the Spirit. The love, the joy, the peace, the patience, the kindness, the goodness, the gentleness, the faithfulness, the self-control that conflicts with what is in us naturally in the flesh, which is dissension, contention, strife, outburst. That's all the reality more fruit I will bear. O rejoice in the Lord, he makes no mistake. He knows the end of each path that I take. And when I am tried and purified, I will come forth as gold. Brothers and sisters, what a thing God is up to. We're going to take a moment to hear from a couple of guys who are here and just hear what they have to say about COVID for them. And by the way, this is a starting of a thing we're going to do for a bit. So COVID for them, what it's meant to my family in regards to the challenge and the joy that we found in it. Matt, you first. I was thinking through um, some of what you're talking about. I looked through James, um, and I thought it was it was right for right now, um, not just for COVID, but for everything going on in the world. Um, and I think the thing that hit me the hardest in uh, in thinking through so many of these things, and and sort of what quarantine and this isolation and a lot of these things that um, that we're kind of thinking through. Um, being that I'm a volunteer firefighter, I end up going out more than some people. I mean, I'm not able to show up to as many things as I would like to, but um, the idea of doing that takes me out of the house, takes me into the public. Um, I couldn't help but think through the idea that this quarantine and isolation has made me be more introspective as to my view on life, uh, my view on what God has done and what he, what he is planning to do. Um, and I think the only thing that I, the, or the main thing I would want to share with, um, with people that are part of Heartland or anyone else that's watching is the idea that um, 
they will know us by our love. Um, whether it's um, the riots that are going on or whether it's COVID, um, they're going to know believers by how they love and care for the people around them. And, and there's a level of guilt with some of that. Um, maybe how I haven't done it as well as I would like to. Um, do people know me by my love? Um, I think that's been the biggest introspection and thought process that I've been working through personally um, and seeing what God says about it. But this, these verses in James are um, uplifting. Um, am I taking joy in the fact that things are difficult? Um, what does that mean for the people around me? And how can I love them better? Thomas, you ready? We have uh, Thomas also that's going to share here with us. There, uh, that's not the only people who are here, but those are the ones who are going to share this morning. So, uh, what you were saying about Romans eight twenty eight has really been cemented in my mind um, about how God works all things together for the good of those who love Him. Um, for me personally, as I was saying, this it's not me that's going to be really affected by if if I get co like. If I get the virus or whatever, it's not me that's going to be affected. It's the people around me. And so, you know, is everyone in my family is at much higher risk than I am. And so that has adjusted my life. I've had to adjust my lifestyle, not as much for concern about myself, but in consideration for the people around me. And it's interesting to to see how... Um, to see how many opportunities the Lord has opened up that never would have been opened up had all of this not happened. And not not like for personal gain, but for ministry. Um, I have so many friends online that we never had conversations that went deeper about anything, that we were just we were focused on gaming. I mean, that's where I met so many people. and And yet, with the whole... COVID-19 thing happening and, and the unrest in the world that has brought up so, so many conversations that never would have been had. And it's really amazing to me to see um, the opportunities that sprung out of something that seems like it's so constricting. So, like, we can't leave the house, we can't go out, and we can't physically do ministry, and yet there's so many opportunities within that. Um, and we've been blessed. You know, a lot of people look at technology as a curse but in reality the the fact that technology is where it's at today has allowed us to be able to have opportunities like i said that we never would have had to begin with um and it's really it's really been amazing as well we i've been able to work on a bunch of media projects that um have touched a lot of people that i've been able to do from you know inside my house that i never would have been a part of uh, because I wouldn't have been stuck inside my house. And, um, you know, I think that's a really, really cool thing that the Lord, you know, it's not me. That's, that's all the Lord. That's the Lord working things together. And I, I think it's really, really, it's exciting, I think. I think it's really exciting to see um, the opportunities God makes out of thin air. You know, you, you, you're like, you're looking at the world, you're like, oh, man, it's so, so bad, so bad. And the Lord's like, here you go. Here you go. Here you go. And you just got to ask him. Ask him. You know, sit down and you say, Lord, I want to serve you some way. And he'll, he'll provide those opportunities, even if you're stuck inside. So I think that's why I think it's as exciting that we're going through this right now. So. Super. So this is part of what we're going to be doing as we're unfolding a plan. Here's the plan. We want to, on the first Sunday of July, having worked things out, resume our opportunities of worshiping together at the school. We have communicated with them, so it will be at Southside School. We will give you some more details on that. The actual date of that will be July 5th. Now, before that, because of the need that we have for... Um, fellowship, encouraging one another. We're looking on the weekend of July 4th, actually the date that the 4th of July Independence Day is being observed this year is July 3rd. That's a Friday. On July 3rd, we're going to 
come together as a group of folks practicing the principles of distancing and that kind of thing at uh, a location where we're going to have a picnic on the grounds. And we'll be giving you the more detail of this. This is where you will bring your picnic and we'll have opportunity to have fellowship, opportunity to do some summer kind of things and enjoy this time so that our interaction, our connection begins to grow. Over the next few weeks as we do this, we're going to have different individuals, different folks of our fellowship come and share about the challenge and the joy that they've found in this trial and the ongoing trials surrounding them for us. And then we're going to, on that July 3rd, have the picnic on the grounds. Summer activities, July 5th, we're going to get together, and where we're at in that point of time, we'll be giving you specifics, but having an opportunity to worship the Lord together and see each other. So that's our plan. That's what's coming up. I'm going to ask you to do this in our connections as well. I have intentionally prolonged our praying for Vietnam. We have had a long history with Vietnam, and we need to seek the Lord in prayer for them and their believers there and their testimony. So I'm going to ask you to keep Vietnam in your prayer as the 20th most difficult place to follow the Lord is on this planet right now. Well, I have enjoyed our time together. Big Dimension Missing is your presence here, but uh, the fellowship of the Spirit and uh, being able to communicate this way does give me a sense of joy, like Thomas talked about, an opportunity to express our love, like Matt talked about, with each other. So, Text us, stay in touch, don't become isolated. Ministry is going on. Give a call if you need personal ministry. There is face-to-face -face ministry with appropriate responses going on in regards to distancing, masking, and that will be happening. God bless. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you do bless us, and you tell us that we're blessed as we handle these things, going to the very crown that life is about, don't let us slip through our hands. Let us be on this, Lord. And every day we have the opportunity of dealing with the trials that come our way, to take the trail that you've asked us to. And Lord, I wish I could say I'm constantly on the triumph victory side here. But God, I need so much to hear you, and I need to have this endurance. So I run to you again like I've run to you before, asking for your grace to help so that your workmanship shows in our world. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Take care. See you soon.